sitting down immediately. You know something? I bet you got a touch of that virus been going around. You don't look no better than you do now. You better stay home from work tomorrow. I can't stay home. She's doing a Saturday night entertaining, you know. If you have a fit if I don't show up. Well, let her have it. I'll just call up and say you got the flu. Well, why the flu? Because it sounds respectable to them. Some white folks get too. They know about the flu. Otherwise, they think you've been cut up or something when you tell them you're sick. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. You Can't Do That on Broadway is a producer's story of how he struggled against great odds to bring one of the great plays of the 20th century to the boards of Broadway. We've got that producer here with us tonight and two of its great stars. Here to introduce them, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun was a seminal play of the American theater. It was brought to Broadway by Philip Rose, and he chronicles his experiences in getting that play to New York in You Can't Do That on Broadway. We're very happy to, to have tonight with us Philip Rose. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Thank and you he brought much. along two, uh, two friends of his, uh, two of uh, this country's finest actors, and I'm very pleased to have them on Theater Talk for the first time, Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right, Phil. Uh, you met Lorraine Hansberry when you guys were kids at summer camp, I think. Oh, was I a kid at that time? I don't <laughs> yes. if you remember that far back. <laughs> she, uh, she's always been a fascinating figure to me. What, what, what was she like? And did you know then that inside of her was this writing talent that was someday going to come out? Well, I didn't know at the moment that I met her because yeah. she was working as a waitress hmm. in this summer camp and did a terrible job at that, which I told her at the time. But when I began to hear her speak occasionally at the summer camp, I began to realize there was something more than just a waitress there. She was remarkable, speaking extemporaneously to people at different subjects of the day. And we became friends during that summer. And when we got back to New York, from time to time she would show me bits of things that she was writing, not really with any passion about what she was doing because she was trying to write something that might sell. Mm. And at that time, for her to be able to sell something to TV or to films was, seemed almost impossible mm -hmm. to her as well as anybody else. Uh, and it took a long time before she decided to write this particular play, which was somewhat autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you, if, if I'm not mistaken, you first heard it in a reading in, in her apartment or someone's apartment? In her apartment on a Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. She had called me to come down for dinner and uh, I was there with her husband and a, another friend and she just read what was about, I would say, an act and a half of what she had written so far. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first heard it. Mm -hmm. And you weren't a producer. You went home and I those was. characters did not leave your... Uh I went home, tried to go to sleep, couldn't, and woke her at about 6.37 in the morning, which she was angry at me for that for several days, <laughs> and uh, said, I want to produce your play. Mm. And I didn't really know what I was talking about, and she certainly didn't know what I was talking about. She had written it in the hope it would be done in some church somewhere <laughs> at some time. Mm. But some, for whatever reason, I decided to say that. Mm. Ruby, when were you brought um, into the show? Because you originated the um, role of the long-suffering wife on Broadway. Yes. Well, the play was well on its way to towards being produced by the time uh, Lloyd was uh, on board. Lloyd Richards, the, Lloyd Richards, the director. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I was asked to, and I remember Lloyd calling to ask me <laughs> what I like to read this, this new uh, play mm -hmm. that they were doing called Raisin in the Sun. And, uh, and I said, well, yes, you know. Uh, but I thought about uh, the title, A Raisin in the Sun. Well, that's a grape that's all dried up, you know, and I wonder, <laughs> <laughs> is it still in the sun? Well, you know. <laughs> I remember thinking about the title, you know. And where's the title from? We Smart should tell Al everybody. It's from uh, a poem by um, by Langston, Langston Hughes. Hughes. What yeah. happens to a dream what, what deferred? What happens to a dream deferred? Mm -hmm. Does it dry up like There's a raisin a, in the sun? Um, or festive. When you first read the script, what was your reaction to it? Did you know this was a this was a major play, something you oh, hadn't yes. seen before? Oh yes, and I remember uh, Lloyd calling to say that he needed an answer by I think noon the next day, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I hadn't by the next morning I hadn't read it yet, so I stayed in bed and read it. Um, I don't think I had any. I don't think I had any children then. 
I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I stayed in bed and read it, and I was, I was enchanted. I was intrigued. I liked it so much. It made me really sit up and pay attention. Short before I finished reading it, even um, Rich, uh, Lloyd Call. And I told him how much I liked the play and how thrilled I was. I, I loved it too, beneath it, you know, I, <laughs> I told him. <laughs> I said, well, I just loved it. Because I just knew that's why he, what he wanted me to do. Which it didn't the... even cross my mind <laughs> that, that he didn't want me to do it Beneath. Beneath is the daughter said, of the... Oh, Ruby, I meant to tell you, <laughs> I want you to do Beneath. I confess my heart sank because... <laughs> Ruth, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want you to do a Ruth. Yeah, that, that's right. Thank you, darling. <laughs> I want you to do a Ruth. And here I was behind the ironing board of life again. I'd done these characters a few few times mm -hmm. uh, in my early uh, career. Did you read the play too, uh, Ossie, when she was uh, considering doing it? And no, no, mm -hmm. no, because you came in to replace Sidney Poitier. Yeah, after the play had been established, it was a success, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Sidney's original commitment was fulfilled. He had to go back to Hollywood, I think, mm -hmm. and so uh, I was brought in to replace him as Walter Lee Younger. Mm -hmm. it, it was a busy time. Many things were happening, and uh, major changes were taking place all over the place. Politically, you know, the South was, was alive, and uh, new attitudes and uh, new thoughts were on the horizon, you know. Uh, so uh, this happened to be one of those things that came along that fitted in with whatever was happening. Mm -hmm. So sometime I, uh, along the way, I got on board, but I don't remember oh, specifically. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember when we first went to to, to um, Phil's house? And uh, do you remember that? Now film? that's what I was going to talk about because yeah, because I think you, you I think you were there you that day. Seen for a moment to have forgotten that mm -hmm. long before Lloyd was even involved. I had a reading of the play at my That's apartment right. at Central Park West, was I, was I and there? you you read, without you being there, we probably would never go I, any further. I read oh. Ruth. You read Ruth then, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was a reading we did to try to convince Sydney yes. to do the play. Right. At that first reading, nobody yes. thought it was really seriously going to go anywhere. Really. Yes. That's why that was not so vivid in your memory. <laughs> we, 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 we were just accustomed sitting to around my apartment to have some mm. fun reading a play. I remember white cups and saucers. I don't See? know why. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, inkling that there was something different about this play. From and an odd shaped mm. coffee pot. <laughs> yeah. That's no sense my wife this play used to hit me with that one, so it <laughs> was out of shape. No sense this play had importance, it was going to have some historical importance that this was the first time that um, uh, the, 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 the working class black struggle was going to be put on, on a stage. George, well, it was just they, another play coming the, through. It kept, no. Yes. And mm -hmm. also, yeah. nobody believed, and Ruby may have to jog her memory a little bit, nobody believed it would go much further than my living room, mm. yes. even the people reading. Yeah, we were accustomed to, we to were having friends. readings of things, yeah. and but that it should be a Broadway show. Yes, that was that was that was an unusual development because nothing like that had been on Broadway before that I remember, where the central characters' lives were not involved with the welfare of somebody white. It was a family, right. and everything that was important in the world took place within that family. Mm -hmm. So no, no, we hadn't seen that before. Well, that was your vision, Phil, to to, to push it to Broadway. Although yes, everyone closed the door in your face. Impulse and now, how important was it to get Sidney Poitier on board? He was he was beginning to break through into Hollywood. He yes. was sort of like mm -hmm. a minor it was light of, very of Hollywood. Important. But I don't think I could have gotten the play on without him. Uh, yeah, but, 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 he, but he'd been a he'd done a film in the 1950s. Oh, he had done some films had done, by then. I he mean, he was known. And you all did No Way Out, right? Yes, that's right. We'd, we'd done No Way Out, yeah. and mm -hmm. Sidney was being known. Oddly uh, enough, he became a big star during the run of Raisin, not mm -hmm. directly ah. because of Raisin, but because he had three films in the can. When did you get a sense that that there was something special about this play, um, that it was really m affecting an audience in a way that very few plays do, that really only the great plays do? I tell you the truth, I really don't remember that moment mm -hmm. because the, the play really struck me as as after after the fact of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, Phil it was it was 
the, the effort was in getting it on and go our first we I think we went to New Haven or was it Philadelphia New Haven first New Haven we went to New Haven so all of the things connected with getting the play on and mm -hmm. fixing it and the rewriting mm -hmm. and and um, and Lloyd's direction and changing direction and the audience helping to tell us what it was we had because I never thought of a comedy drama mm -hmm. because but that's what we had mm -hmm. because the audience we, but Lloyd had directed it as a drama straight out drama mm -hmm. and but the audience wanted to laugh and it was it, it, it was a comedy drama that's what it was mm -hmm. and I remember when that realization was presented to us after uh, during the New Haven run right after the first performance I remember this deep di uh, conversation with Lloyd as he tried to explain to me certain things and certain things. As I look back on it now, all he was set, trying to say to me was, Ruby, lighten up, let people laugh. Just, which I, and I was saying, but, but because he told me things that were, didn't, didn't, didn't go in that direction. Mm -hmm. and, but if he, just, if he had just said, lighten up, Ruby, or something like that, <laughs> I would have gotten it. And then Lorraine came over, I remember she said, and Ruby, uh, she put her hands on me, and I was so angry with, with that. I wanted, to, I, wanted, I wanted to do like that, no, because it was everything that we had done looked like for naught. Oh, <laughs> tears, tears. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was, and, but, uh, but she wanted to help me make the adjustment. Ruby had, I always felt the most difficult role in the play. Uh -huh. And I was so pleased when Walter Kerr wrote a review in which he really picked Ruby out as giving one of the great performances, mm -hmm. not just of this play, but of many, many other plays. And I remember how upset Claudia McNeil got. <laughs> <laughs> and she made a remark <laughs> that you were having some kind of affair with Walter Kerr. Oh my you God. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Lucky Walter Kerr. But, you know, the, the play affected all of us. Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> Asi, I'm curious. Uh, you're an accomplished writer uh, with Pearly Victorious. What do you think it is, what do you admire about A Raisin in the Sun? Just as a, as a writer looking at that play when you were in it and thinking about it, what Lorraine has very constructed. Well, there the are several things which I admire I still do very deeply. Number one, uh, she's a very gifted writer, and she created characters, some of uh, whom uh, were familiar, but she introduced Beneath her. Mm -hmm. She introduced Asagai on stage. We had never seen those kind of characters on stage before. We knew Mama. We knew a little bit about uh, uh, Ruby, and uh, she introduced these two brand new characters. And she also, uh, in an interesting way, uh, took us back to Bigger Thomas, you know, Richard Wright's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, character. But Sidney uh, not only had the, the push and emphasis of a Bigger Thomas, but there was another thing going on in Sidney's mind, and we hadn't seen that kind of clarity and activity on the stage before. Mm -hmm. So it was her, her characters, her, her bringing to the theater a new set of, of people for us to contemplate, new images mm -hmm. which we were hungry to have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that impressed me. Uh, well, most of all. we keep calling the character uh, Sidney because we think of us, uh, uh, Walter, uh, Walter, yeah, Walter we keep calling Walter Sidney, but Walter, Walter seems to me to be a very difficult character to play because he, could be s not done right. He could be really unsympathetic, and yet at the end, you really feel for him and 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 He's hope heroic that he end. can break out of this and attain his dreams, even though those dreams, as his mother says, are about money, corrupts the the the, the family. Difficult to play that part. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it was difficult to play uh, because once again, you know, Lorraine had so many colors and strands uh, that were not a part of the familiar character you had to reach and sort of understand where she was coming from and uh, meet her halfway. Mm -hmm. And uh, it so happened that Sidney had this capacity to do that which was serious and of substance, while at the same time a kind of brilliant effervescence, yeah. uh, particular, particular to Sidney Poitier, was also boiling all over the stage at the same time. Yeah. And Sidney could do that. And uh, 
it added tremendously to what the character meant and the impact. But that was Sidney. Mm. The rest of us, you know, <laughs> we great imitators of Sidney Poitier. We never quite pulled it off. No, he, I bet he was he pretty good. He must did. have been pretty good, though. But uh, he, I, I laugh when he talks about his experience doing Walter Lee and what Lloyd once said to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well you, you have to remember that it was never my intention to be an, an actor at all. You're a writer. I, I was a writer. Yeah. And even while I was working uh, in uh, Raising in the Sun, I was also busy writing my own play. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I knew what was required of the actor, but I really didn't want, I didn't have time to do uh, the, the homework, the digging, the, the self-absorption that goes into a normal, I just wanted to come in, recite the lines, do the cues, <laughs> and then get off stage then and come do back my to work. work. It's slightly cheating, you know, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to do. Uh, Lloyd, who is a very perceptive man uh, and friend as well as the uh, uh, director, uh, one afternoon he understood something that was happening, and I understood it too, but I didn't know what to do about it. He said to me, Ossie, uh, I want you to go out. I would do me a favor. I said yes. When you go out on stage today, mm -hmm. you know, forget the, the script, forget Lorraine, forget everybody. Go out, on, go out on stage, and make Claudia McNeil give you the money. Make her give you the money. Let the play go any place it wanted. Mm -hmm. You make her give you the money. I could understand that as an intellectual concept, right? But I couldn't pull it off. Mm -hmm. I couldn't trust myself to turn myself loose or to let all the forces that he was calling on right. out. You know, I, I, I had to keep control. Yeah. So uh, I gave a measured performance and I think I was delightful enough. I don't think I let the play down a great deal, but I didn't elevate it a great deal either. I kept it pretty much on an even key. May I make one comment about that specifically? Yes. <laughs> Sidney was only in the play for five and a half months. Mm. Mr. Davis played it for something over a year, I believe. So I don't think he did that bad a job. You <laughs> <laughs> would have fired a big well, person. He, yeah. I certainly I don't think I'd have let him Since hang I've taken your long. money, I quite didn't do a bad <laughs> job. I didn't want him <laughs> being there just because he was writing another play in his dressing room. <laughs> but, the, but these were unusual characters. They, yes. they were driven. They had middle class aspirations. Yes. We were unaccustomed to seeing right. people with middle, blacks with middle class aspirations. Mm -hmm. Girl who, a woman who's going to be a doctor. An asagai, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. elite snob. But they're still fresh. I watched the movie yes. recently yes, the other day. Do you well, think this play could be revived and would hold up oh, now? Oh, very <laughs> definitely, and that is why. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, her particular gift, her understanding what was going on. Now take a look at the broad, broadest picture uh, uh, at the moment of what was happening. The, uh, the, the, the black persona, particularly on stage, you know, had certain definite characteristics. Mm -hmm. We were good for comedy and laughter and having a lot of fun and fish fries and singing and all that sort of thing. Uh, but and if, if it was drama, it was about somebody being lynched and poor mama sitting or, and things like that. But uh, the civil rights movement had come along. Uh, Martin Luther King had appeared. A little boy in Mississippi named Emmett Kill had been, mm -hmm. had been killed you know, and, 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 and there was a tremendous amount of upsurge in the black community and in America. Mm -hmm. We all realized that the images by which America judged black folks were no longer tenable. Mm. We had previously been on Broadway in a play called Anna Lucasta, mm -hmm. but that was once again a fun thing, right. and, you know, a comedy and all of that. Here was America being presented with another set of images to feed America's hunger, because America already knew that the old images mm -hmm. were not functioning anymore. A new set of people were on the scene, and they were making new demands. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry was at the very middle of that struggle in the political arena mm -hmm. and otherwise. So she brought that passion and that clarity to the play. Right. She presented to America, she said, no, of course these old images they would never were us. Right. Let me show you who we really are. Bam, here we are. Right. Right. And there was that shock yeah. of recognition and uh, 
Recognition for all, though, because this family, like any family, yes. black or white, whatever, is, is pursuing the American dream. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But there was Claudia McNeil, who, the, the, this was another, that, that it, I don't know where, where to place it in this, um, in the, but, but Claudia was a familiar kind of, she was the closest uh, mm -hmm. a thing to a familiar character right. in terms of the American. The mother. In the, uh, the mother, yeah. who played the mother, mm -hmm. the theater going public. So it's, but, and I, I remember feeling amazed that Claudia really was the star of the show. Mm -hmm. Because at Curtain Call, it was, you would think, it was, it, it, I think it was Sydney's. The play was starring Sydney's and what he wanted, but the audience reacted very differently to Claudia, mm -hmm. and we thought about that. And Claudia was a familiar character. Claudia was Mama. Mm -hmm. Claudia was Mammy. Claudia was keeping the young black buck straight. Right. Claudia was the kind of the character uh, that you can depend on in American society to keep these, if as long as there's Mama, white folks never need to worry because Mama's going to take care of it. She's mm -hmm. going to put him in his, she's going to cool and cool him down and calm the waters. I would uh, like to continue that. And, well, she, she was a gorgeous actor though. Yes, with she a was. Beautiful singing voice. Because oh, yes. it became a big problem for Sydney. Oh, and yes. he realized it early on, and uh, for a long time, I, I had people turn the play down, very well respected people in the industry, because to them, obviously I'm talking about white, wealthy people, mm -hmm. to them, the Walter Lee was not a character they could identify with at all. Mm. And so that's what we were fighting in the play, and as Ruby's pointing out, it was very easy to accept Mama, mm -hmm. particularly for the white audience, mm -hmm. and even the black audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what Sidney had to fight and overcome, and it took him some time, and Ruby was partially responsible. She had a talk with him. Mm -hmm. She may or may not remember. I don't remember. In Chicago, when he was really struggling, and yes. he and I were having problems with each other as a result, too. Yes. And she said to him what we had wanted him to do. She said, she said just take this play over. Take it away from her. Mm. Yes. It's your play. Yes. It's and that's when he began to do it in Chicago. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Make her what, give you the money. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's about. That's it's the root of that play. Of that. It, it mirrored something else about uh, black people in America that was still living with black men in particular, mm -hmm. uh, young men. As, as long as you can be the, the hero in, in a, an interracial play or in any kind of play, if, you're, if, if your existence makes better the welfare or the life of somebody white, you know, if you are enhancing the life of somebody white. But if you want something for yourself or for other black people, then you're or, a threat. Then, th then you're a threat. Right. And so it's still, it's still that way, you know. Yeah. And it's but a subliminal thing that happens in our culture. We, we will accept you. Mm -hmm. If you let us know that it's all cool with you and uh, right. you know that you're not going to want something right. that's going to be inimical to any right. uh, but, but let me tell that you we respect another very revolutionary image mm -hmm. that we seldom mention in connection with this, and that is Phil Rose. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, somebody shows up who has a play that pushes aside all of the old stereotypes and presents us black people, you know, in terms that are respectful, that are dynamic, a new set of images, and that were involved with the struggle which we were already involved in in America. Mm -hmm. And that man was Phil Rose, the quiet producer sitting in the back who never raised his voice. <laughs> but he, by his choices, you know, made the change on Broadway that we were trying to make down south and in civil rights and other areas. Mm -hmm. Phil is one of those quiet heroes of the struggle, mm -hmm. and he deserves credit for having done that. Well, you can read all about um, the, the struggle to get A Raisin in the Sun uh, on Broadway in You Can't Do That on Broadway, a memoir by, by Philip Rose. Phil, it's very nice to have you on Theater Talk. Well, thank you very, very much. And to uh, wonderful, charming, talented actors, uh, Ruby D. <laughs> great to have you here and Ozzie Davis, actor and writer. Thank you, sir. Uh, great to have you here. I didn't make this world. It was handed to me exactly like it is. Yes, I want some yachts someday. What's wrong with that? And I want to put some pearls on my wife's neck. 
You tell me what man decides in this world what woman should wear pearls and what woman shouldn't. I tell you, I'm a man. I say, I want her to wear it, Jim. How are you going to feel on the inside? I'm going to feel fine. You won't have nothing left. I'm going to feel fine. I look that man right in his eye. All right, Mr. Charlie. All right, Mr. Lindler. That's your neighborhood out there. You want to keep it that way? You got a right to keep it that way. Just give me that money and the house is yours. And I'll feel fine. Fine. I say more than that. I say you give me that money and you won't have to live next door to no bunch of stinking... Walter. I'll feel fine. Maybe I'll get down on my black knees. All right, Mr. Charlie. All right, Mr. Great White Father. You just give us that money and we won't come out there and dirty up your white folks' neighborhood. And I'll feel fine. Fine! 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 Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.